And good morning from Lake Manor Chapel in beautiful, sunny, cold Chatsworth, California, where our, our word today is going to talk about harvesting. There's some harvesting going on in our scripture today, and it's, uh, it's fascinating that there's more than one kind. I'll share that with you when we get to it. Uh, we're in Revelation 14, and uh, in the Revelation, apart and aside from the sequencing of the events that take place during the seven-year tribulation, we have these little chapters along the way called interludes. An interlude is like an intermission. It's a, it's a pause in the narrative that fleshes out some of the details of the day of the Lord. And I believe it reveals and is meant to reveal not only the heart of God for justice and judgment, which is clear from this book, but the heart of God for mercy. Um, our God is a merciful God, and it, it's clear again and again as we go through this. We're on the third of three interludes. Chapter 12, you might recall, was all about the dragon or Satan, and uh, God is using him to persecute Israel, literally to sift her like wheat as Jesus might have said, and there's a purpose for that. And then in chapter 13, the focus was on the beast. Remember the beast, the Antichrist, and his henchman, the false prophet? And their goal is to set out to deceive the world and to control it, which will happen for a time. This third interlude comes to us in chapter 14, and we're gonna see a lot of activity going on relative to what I like to describe as God's last call to humanity to believe and repent. The 144,000, remember them? They reappear at the beginning of chapter 14 in the first five verses. John sees them standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb of God. And you'll recall they are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel that God appointed, anointed literally, to get the word out about the Messiah during the tribulation. He's, again, he's bringing Israel back to himself. Those 140,000, they were called the first fruits of the tribulation to God and to the Lamb. There were others to follow. Then we have a, a flying angel, it says. If you look at it in uh, verse 6, it says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So we have the, uh, the flying angel who is bringing both an invitation and a warning. He says in a loud voice, you'll see it in verse seven, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. I want you to notice that God's judgment is always preceded with an invitation and a warning. There will be no one standing before him on judgment day in the white throne judgment who will be able to say to him, you didn't give me a chance. Revelation is full of last chances for many people. And it's up to them to make the right decision. So God is a God of judgment, but he is also a God of mercy, amen? Interesting phrase, the way James put it. He wrote, mercy triumphs over judgment. So he's saying judgment is good, but mercy is a higher good. Because mercy cancels out judgment. It's more powerful than judgment, if you will. God's mercy is more powerful than God's judgment. And thank God that he is rich in mercy. By God's grace, he gives us what we do not deserve. By his mercy, he withholds that which we do deserve. So I thank God when I pray to him, I thank him. I say, God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. We need both every day. Then here comes another angel following along and brings the message that Babylon is fallen. Babylon is symbolic. It's not the city itself, but it's a metaphor for a world system that has corrupted the nations, which are described here as drinking the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We see that going on in the world today. 
most of the nations of the world are corrupt. We used to like to think of ourselves here in the United States of America as being a Christian nation. I want to say to you that's a lovely sentimental thought, and a lot of the founding fathers were of that mindset, but there's no such thing as a Christian nation. And so the nations are being deceived. That will include the one that we're in, more and more so. We're seeing it happening as we're still here. And that is, uh, we're succumbing to the, uh, the call of Babylon, the call of the world, to be part of a one world, new world order. It's coming our way. And so this interlude has one angel after another, making announcement after announcement. And they are designed to both invite and to warn. Listen to the third angel that begins verse 9. It says this, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and who receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. We're now looking at this point into the day of the white throne judgment to come. It takes place, as we'll see, at the end of the millennial reign, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. So what we're getting is a glimpse uh, an interlude, if you will. When the angel says to write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, I think it should be noted that there are things worse than physical death. Now we're told in the letter to the Hebrews that Satan has held people in a grip of fear all of their lives. Number one human fear, fear of death. Number one. So everybody said, ding, 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 number one. There's worse. And physical death. So, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. There are things worse than physical death, depending, of course, on whether or not you're in the Lord when you go. If you're not, you'll find out what I'm talking about. And verse 12 gives us an expression that I think deserves a little bit of elaboration. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Sometimes people say of someone, man, that fellow has the patience of a saint. I'm not one of those, but there are people thus described. Patience is just not a big enough word for what we're talking about here. There are other translations that use words like endurance, perseverance. It's not just, you know, looking at your watch and tapping your foot. It's not passive. It's a very aggressive attitude of hanging on, enduring, persevering in the face of adversity. That's the patience and faith of the saints. Now, when we get to the conclusion of this little interlude with all, after all of the angels have to say what they have to say, and it concludes with a harvesting. I mentioned there are two kinds of harvests described in this chapter. Two harvestings that come, as Jesus said in his parables, at the end of the age. He spoke of this in Matthew 13 in the parable of the sower. There's going to be a harvesting. When does it happen? At the end of the age. So we're looking again forward, past the tribulation into the future. First we'll see Jesus harvesting his own. Then we'll see angels reaping a different kind of harvest, a harvest of unrepentant sinners. There's two kinds of harvests here. Listen as we read this. This is a uh, Beginning with, oh, let's see, verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Everybody know what a sickle is? No, it's not one of those frozen trees that you buy when the guy comes down the street in his truck. That's a popsicle. This is the kind of sickle that you use to gather in 
the harvest, the wheat, if you will. Then another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. So the angel's now talking to Jesus. You follow that? Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. That is the reaping of the redeemed by Jesus himself. Do you remember he said, in fact, John the Baptist said this about him. He said, the one coming after me is greater than I am. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then he said something about harvesting. He said, his winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will separate the wheat from the chaff. And the chaff he will burn up. And the wheat he will gather into his barn. That's what we're seeing here. The fulfillment of what John was talking about with Jesus. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. I want you to notice, the first harvesting, Jesus is the harvester. The second harvesting, the angels are the harvester. And it's a different kind of harvest altogether. So it says, the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. You've heard of the grapes of wrath? This is it, this is them. The imagery is of a great deal of bloodshed. It says up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs, which is roughly the length of the nation of Israel. This interlude event seems to match up very closely with what we'll read about in a future chapter. When Jesus returns at the second coming, he returns to something that we call the battle at Armageddon. And at that second coming, when he comes back, it says this about Jesus. You remember he comes on a white horse, wearing a robe dipped in blood, with a name written on him, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, sword that comes out of his mouth, not a literal sword, but his word literally is that which, which the sharpness of it divides truth from fiction. It says this about Jesus. When we get to chapter 19, you'll see it. It says, He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This will be the last of the interludes. These were designed to, as I say, flesh out some details of how things are going to work when they do happen. And some of them are over a thousand years away. When we get to the next chapter, beginning with chapter 15, we will return to the sequential events of the tribulation. They will conclude with the third and final series of judgments. You remember there were three series of judgments. The seal judgments, the trumpet judgments. Coming up next, the worst of the lot, the bowl judgments. They're the last and they're the worst. By the end of those, everyone who is going to repent will have repented. And don't you know God knows exactly when he gets that last person. And I believe it, that last one, and he gets that last one, and he knows who it is. That's when he says, okay, son, you can go back now. It's time. We got everyone we're going to get. So the main focus of chapter 14 is two harvests. One by Jesus harvesting his own, bringing his wheat into his barn, into everlasting life. The other by the angels who are reaping to the winepress of the wrath of God, to ultimate destruction. What do we get from chapter 14? I believe it reveals God's heart for justice, because justice is correct, it's right, it's good. When you see someone out there in the world that's defying the rules, bending the rules, breaking the rules, doesn't your heart cry out for justice? That happens to me on the freeway all the time. I go, where's the CHP now? I mean, a guy practically just blew me away. You can be in the, in the carpool lane or the number one lane, 
doing 75 miles an hour and they consider you pokey. And they're flying around there. I'm going, where's the CHP? I want justice. <laughs> so we like justice. It's a good thing. But more than that, we need mercy. And the heart of God for mercy is all through this book. Everyone gets another chance. Everyone gets another warning. Everyone gets another call. Today, if you hear his voice, it says, don't harden your heart. Now, if you haven't already done so, I suggest you take God up on his offer of mercy if you haven't already done so. We are at the last hour, and the clock is ticking. So back to the judgments, starting with chapter 15. We'll get there next week, and we'll get towards wrapping this up and the real exciting news, uh, the, the real good stuff that's coming. There's coming a day. Well, I, I won't get into the marriage supper of the Lamb right now, but that's coming up in one of the, the future chapters. But there's coming a day when there will be a one world government and one world leader, but his name will be Jesus. And that's going to take place for a thousand years. Imagine a thousand years, no devil, no demons, no false prophet, just Jesus running everything from what will be the capital of the world, which will be Jer Jerusalem. Looking forward to that. In the meantime, uh, once again, God gives you invitation. God gives you warning. God has mercy for you. Take him up on it. Amen.